to Yossi. Thank you very much to Minister. Um, just a few. Thank you. Just a few technical things. Thank you. We're going to. The minister's now going to say a, sh uh, a few short words. After that, the program. So whatever the time is, I don't have my watch. And after that, we're going to begin. So after the speech, all the forums, the, the panels, and everything's going to happen. So, minister, please, uh, wherever you want to go, it's fine by us. The podium works as well. Thank you again. Well, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, I was still supposed to deliver a speech. <laughs> so you're going to have to bear with me, but I'll try to make it uh, a bit less boring than speeches usually are. Uh, first, good morning to everyone. Welcome to those of you who've been here for the first time. Welcome to Yossi Vadi. I mean, 1972. You know, we were all kids then. Most of the people in this room were not even born yet. I'm glad you finally made it back to Singapore, and I hope you've noticed that we've kind of grown up in the intervening 43 years. Um, I hope you've all also enjoyed the panel discussion, and contrary to popular belief, we're not as uptight as people often uh, make out Singaporeans to be. Um, I wanted to, since this is uh, partly an NUS event, uh, I hope you don't mind if I do a bit of a sales pitch for NUS because I'm an alumni from NUS too. In, in 1904, uh, the several local communities in Singapore, and I would say also at that time in 1904, there was also a significant Jewish community from Baghdad in Singapore. But anyway, the different communities raised about 87,000 straight dollars. $87,000 in 1904 is a big sum of money, a significant sum of money. Anyway, they got this sum of money and they established the School of Medicine in 1905. And that's why NUS claims today to be 110 years old. Uh, this was called the Strait Settlement and Federated Malay State Government Medical School. Coincidentally, 1905 was also the year that the Japanese defeated the Russians in a major war. Most of you probably not know this. I didn't know this until I prepared for the speech. <laughs> it was a war that was fought with industrial innovation. In other words, the Japanese won because they were able to mass produce machine guns, rifle carbines, and ironclads. It's not that the Japanese invented these tools, but they were able to mass produce it earlier, faster, and in a more pervasive way. And that was a decisive difference in that war. For those of you who are physicists, 1905 is also significant because it's the year that they called uh, the, what's it in Einstein? Annus Mirabilis, the wonderful year, or the miracle year for Einstein. Four papers major papers that he published. One paper on Brownian motion of particles, which really leads to help confirm the theory of atoms, uh, the theory of special relativity, which we all know Einstein for, uh, the photoelectric phenomena behind light, which is really about the quantum physics of light and photons, which is also relevant if you talk about fiber optics today. Um, and I think there was also that famous uh, mass energy equivalence. So 1905, good vintage, and therefore I think we should you know, celebrate NUS for starting in a very good year. But let's, <laughs> thank you. But let's fast forward 110 years to today. And as I said just now, if you think about the Russian-Japanese war example, something changed in the beginning of the 20th century. And fast forward to today, we know that something has again changed. As I mentioned, the transistor, the computer, the internet, the World Wide Web, internet commerce, 3D printing, 
are platform technologies that will completely transform the way we live, work, play, engage, do business, entertain each other, ultimately maybe even the way we have sex, right? Something fundamental has changed. There's going to be a tsunami of data. There's going to be an explosion of the internet of things. Everything can be connected. Everything can be smart. Everything can both sense and do something. And if this revolution is going on, then again the question is, it's not just where these technologies are invented, but which cities, which countries, which systems, which teams are going to be best placed to innovate, to mass produce, to do proofs of concept, and ultimately to execute and to implement. That, to me, is a central challenge behind the smart nation. You know, a lot of the best motivators are actually paranoia. My political paranoia is this. Because technology has changed, there is a huge swathe of middle-class white-collar jobs which are at risk. At risk to computers and to robots. Even as a surgeon, computers and robots are able to operate at a level of precision. Even though I have got pretty steady hands, I cannot match a computer. So the point is, we are on the verge of a potential age of significant middle-class unemployment or underemployment or stagnating wages. In fact, stagnating wages, you already see that in many parts of the world. It's not a right-wing conspiracy. It is a phenomena of technological progress. And therefore, we need to pre-position ourselves, get ahead of that curve, and serve that curve, all risks being swamped by this tsunami of change. Because, my friends, you can't outcompete a robot for mechanical, reproducible activities. You can't outcompete a computer doing computations and calculations, which are fairly straightforward and routine, albeit on a massive scale. So hence, we decided that we've got to get Singapore ahead of the curve. And holding events like this is also part of, the, of our strategy because, as I've said, it's not just about the innovation of the idea, but just like Brownian motion, it's also about the diffusion of that idea. And then it's about execution, hard work and discipline to execute it, and then to connect it to smart money, money that actually amplifies your idea and your product not just because you're so smart, but because it comes with mentorship, it comes with networking, it comes with access to the market. In the case of Singapore, uh, the Prime Minister has laid out certain domains that we want to focus on. So for instance, I'll, I'll cite a few. For instance, we want to make sure that this is a secure, safe, reliable place for digital exchange. It means protection of identity. It means ensuring the veracity and the integrity of your commercial system. It is a place where a digital exchange, the marketplace, is protected by appropriate rules, regulations, and infrastructure. Another example, apart from moving bits around, we need to move people around more efficiently. One big political challenge we have had is we've got this system called uh, certificates of entitlement. People pay a lot by a piece of paper to entitle them to drive a car for 10 years. But actually, if you, the real solution is to improve public transport to the point it becomes the most reliable, the most efficient, the most comfortable way of move, getting from point A to point B. And this is a problem which, at the heart of it, is an engineering and computational challenge. You mentioned Grab Taxi. I mean, all these apps which are all dancing around the larger problem, the larger challenge of how do you move people around in the most efficient, 
and most pleasant way possible. Another example, the biggest social phenomena of our age is aging. In the case of Singapore, in the next 20 years, the proportion of people over the age of 65 is going to treble in 20 years. If you look at what's happening in China, if you look at what has already happened in Japan, if you look at Europe, even if you look at Israel, this silver tsunami should alert everyone to the fact that there are both challenges and enormous opportunities because these sort of social economic transformations occur once in a lifetime. So again, how can we bring smart technologies to bear in this focal point of dealing with aging? How can we empower people who are seniors? How can we have better health care? How can we have better home care? How can we have better security? How can we improve the quality of life? So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that our smart nation vision is not really about technology. Technology is a lever, a tool, or a platform. But at the heart of it, it is about people. And our objective is to improve the quality of life of Singaporeans. Second, to expand opportunities for Singaporeans and Singapore enterprises and friends of Singapore, which many of you are. And so that's first thing, right? Uh, to improve quality of life opportunity. And the third thing is about community and social bonding. You know, it's this peer-to-peer -peer networks are all the rage nowadays. But can you really use technology to strengthen that sense of cohesion, that sense of identity, that sense of purpose? so that people are motivated, are empowered to go out there and fulfill uh, their dreams. So let me just end here by again welcoming all of you to this conference, to this, actually it's not a conference, to this meetup, right? I hope you will find that Singapore is an interesting place. We have had to be innovative, not because it's sexy to be innovative, but because we need it for survival. We understand that the world has changed. We cannot, on our own, shape the world in our vision. But we have to act, understand how best to take advantage of the opportunities that the world gives. And I hope you will understand also that Singapore will be a good place, a safe place, a hospitable place for your ideas, for your teammates, for your enterprises, and use us as a platform to pursue your dreams, your hopes, and hopefully overcome your fears. So thank you, Yossi. Thank you, Lily. Thank you all for being here, for being part of this wonderful journey. Thank you. Thank you.